Him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon His head, the Father's heart displayed for us, oh God, we thank You for the On Calvary's hill, we curse your name, and even still, you bore our shame, and you paid the cost, oh God, we thank you for the Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Oh, Jesus, You will reign forevermore. The victory is Yours. So we sing Your praise and endless hallelujahs to Your holy name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. And offer this sacrifice for every sin. Our Savior died. The Lord of life can't be content. Our God has risen from the grave. To behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Oh, Jesus, You will reign forevermore. The victory is Yours. So we sing your praise and endless hallelujahs to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. And when the age of death is done, we'll see your face. Bright as the sun, and we'll bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will sing. So behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. But Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. So behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. But Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. So we sing. Hallelujah to your holy name. Oh Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. You reign forevermore. The victory is yours. You reign forevermore. The victory is yours.
promise of acceptance from a good and gracious king.
Hello, my name is Martha Peace, and I'm here to talk about the characteristics of the godly older woman. When I was a new Christian, I read the Bible for the first time in my life, and I knew I wanted to do something for the Lord, but I didn't know what it would be. And so I kept reading and kept reading, and I got to the book of Titus, and I was young. I was 33 years old when this happened, and I got to chapter 2, where it talks about the older women and the godly character that they're supposed to have by God's grace, and then the seven mandates that they are to teach the younger women. And I thought about that, and I thought, there's my ministry. But I, I knew I wasn't the older woman category, but I figured it would take that many years for the Lord to help me become that kind of woman. My experience has taught me, shown me, that when an older woman befriends a younger woman, she is likely to have influence over the younger woman's thinking and actions. Now, this can be bad news or it can be good news. Some examples of bad news, most of the examples that I could think of would be a woman who is not doctrinally sound. In Ephesians 4, 13 through 15, he's talking about equip, how God gives spiritual gifts for the equipping of the saints until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And some examples of bad news is if the older woman leads the younger woman into mysticism. Now, mysticism is God leading her through intuition and feelings instead of through his word. Another example is leading her into heresy. A heresy is a wrong concept of God. Perhaps they have a harsh legalistic view of God or a genie-in-the-bottle view of God uh, if I just rub God the right way, he's going to pop out and grant me my wish. I call that the Santa Claus view. And then number three, a wrong view influencing her in worldly philosophies. And the feminist philosophy hit full bore back when I was a young woman. And it began in the 1960s through Betty Friedan's leadership. Now, her philosophy of life, her thought was that women are not developed as fully human beings. And to, in order to develop a mature character, they must go back to school or work because if you just stay at home and raise your kids, you become a non-person. Well, who wants to be a non-person? And another philosophy is the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may die. That was my philosophy of life before I got saved. And then number four, bad news, a wrong view of sanctification. Sanctification is a process that God begins in your heart when he saves you. And he, he works on this, and you mature as the years go by into more and more Christ-likeness until he takes you to be with him. Some believe that it is an instantaneous experience, such as you rebuke the demon or... The Keswick view, which is unbiblical, is a crisis point of total surrender. Some people call that let go and let God. 
But the Bible teaches that there's a balance here. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So we have a responsibility to work at becoming these things that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But God supernaturally convicts us of our sin, gives us grace and empowerment in order to do that. And then number five, and this we see a lot in counseling. The older woman takes up an offense against the younger woman's husband and influences her to leave him. Or she feels sorry for the younger woman. So when as a counselor to women, I've had to learn that I... I just have to remember, hey, I'm not hearing the other side of the story. So that, those are just some examples of bad news of the older woman influencing the younger woman. And then examples of good news, I have three here. Number one, she is doctrinally sound. Second Timothy 2, verse 15 it's not just the men who need to know the Bible and rightly interpret it. The women are too. And then number two, she herself, good news, is under the authority of the elders and, or the pastors in her church and her husband if she is married. Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey your leaders, talking about in the context of the church, for they keep watch over your souls. And then number three, she is mature or maturing in her character. Second, ten, Second Peter 1, verse 3 through 11. Peter talks about, this is the last letter he wrote that we know of. And what he was saying here is, he wanted to remind them of the gospel and remind them of making sure that they really knew the Lord. Starting in verse 3, seeing that God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, talking about Christ, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by this, he, these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. We, by God's grace, can become more and more like Christ, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. For this very reason also, applying all diligence and see, we should be able to look back on the time when God saved us until now and know that all this list that Peter's going to give, that we can honestly say we are increasing in these things. It says, all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence knowledge, in your knowledge self-control, in your self-control perseverance, in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. And that's the agape word, love. For if these qualities are yours, if they describe you and are increasing, not sinless perfection, you're not going to ever have that in this lifetime, but they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's a warning here. He said, if you don't see this in your life and you don't see this over the time as increasing, for he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. And then he exhorts them, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Make sure that you really are a born-again Christian. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So she 
is mature or maturing in her character. So the characteristics of the older woman are just very carefully laid out in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Now, Paul wrote the book of Titus, and if you want to know what your pastor is supposed to be doing, read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Those are the pastoral epistles. It gives the character qualities they're supposed to have and then what they are supposed to be doing. So Paul um, had Titus, who was a Gentile convert to Christianity. He took him to Crete, which is an island off the coast of Greece. And he, they went around witnessing to people and establishing little churches all around the island. So Paul left Titus there to help with these little churches and get them started and have elders and all of that. And uh, he wrote this letter back to Titus giving him further instruction. So he says, I want the older men to be this way and do this. I want the older women, the young men, the young women, the slaves. He, he, he goes every category. But the older women, and this is what struck me when I first time I ever read the Bible, and I stopped and I prayed and I asked God to make me that kind of woman because I figured it would take from the time I was 33 until I was old, if he let me live that long, um, to become that kind of woman. But it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women. And there's the seven mandates to love their husbands, love their children, to be sensible. That means to have a sound mind, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. And the whole point of all of that is so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So let's just go through these different godly character traits. And if, even if you're young, you need to ask God to help you begin working on these things now. The first one is reverent in her behavior. Now, I like how the King James Version translates that. It says, behavior as becometh holiness. Doesn't, just, doesn't that sound holy? <laughs> I like that. Uh, the behavior word in the Greek, it means demeanor or deportment. Deportment is how you act. Some of you may be old enough like me to remember, I used to get a grade in deportment in school. I don't even know if they even, they don't, they don't even know what that word means now. But I doubt if they care. <laughs> Matthew Henry said, this is behavior that becomes women consecrated to God. Another commentary said, a measure and role of conduct to be looked to. Adam Clark in his commentary says these women are to be in their dress, gait, and general deportment such as their holy calling requires and that they not be like the world, but like the church, decent throughout and adorned with holiness within. So I thought about that, and how does that apply to our lives? One of the things that I thought about is how we dress, and not sensual, not provocative, not look like a man, uh, be feminine. In First Timothy 2, Verse 9 and 10, it says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. And then Paul describes what proper clothing is. Modestly and discreetly, 
not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. This is the adornment of good works. Secondly, under application, how we behave, not in a sensual, provocative way, not look like a man. It doesn't mean we can't wear pants, but we can look feminine when we do that. Um, and we have good manners. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not act unbecomingly. Some versions say love is not rude. Number three, under application, is our attitude. The holy women of old used to adorn themselves with a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, this is First um, Peter chapter 3. And then Proverbs 31, verse 25 and verse 21 and 25. This is the excellent wife, the godly wife that we all like. Oh my goodness, she was amazing. But um, she, verse 21 says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. And then um, verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. So she's not panicking. She's not fretting. She's not scared all the time making up things in her mind. What if this happens? What if that happens? And begins to feel as if that is happening when it is not. Um, the gentle and quiet, well, that's behavior. She has good attitude. The holy women adorn themselves with a gentle and quiet spirit. In First Peter uh, 3, let me r read this to you. Your, verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. The heart is just who you are on the inside. It's what you're thinking. It's what you're desiring. With the imperishable or unfading, or you could say eternal, quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Now, first time I read that, and probably the next 50 times I read it, I still didn't know what that meant. I thought it meant you didn't whisper when you talk. And if you do that, you annoy me because I can't hear you. <laughs> so have a personality and speak up. But I did this huge study on gentle and quiet spirit, and I concluded two things. A woman with a gentle and quiet spirit is not given to fear or anger. And secondly, she accepts God's dealings with her as good. So she submits herself to God's will. Sometimes God tests her and takes her through trials to mold her into Christ's likeness. But she doesn't panic and she trusts God with all her heart. Um, she's not afraid to do what's right. So a godly woman is um, dresses in a godly way. She behaves herself. She's not rude. She has good manners. And she has the attitude of a gentle and quiet spirit. So... So it says, the first thing is that she is reverent in her behavior. The second description of the godly woman is she is not a malicious gossip. Well, this Greek word comes from the Greek word diabolos, the devil. The, the gossip word, the underlying meaning is devil or Satan. 
to accuse, to repudiate, to give false information, to be a tale bearer. Matthew Henry in his commentary said this was a great and too common a fault to speak ill of people and to separate very friends. Another commentary said this is a besetting sin of some elderly women. So under application, we need to guard our words carefully. We need to stop and think about what we're going to say. Um, I don't know about you, but I know I have blurted out so many things that later I regretted saying. First Timothy 3, verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. So what I, I thought about, well, what is the biblical criteria for the words that we say? One, Paul talks about your words should be edifying. Ephesians 4, verse 29. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. And another criteria for the words we are to speak are truthful words. Ephesians 4, verse 25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then in Philippians 4, um, we are to speak good report words. Philippians 4, 8. Hold on. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, think God honoring, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, excellent and praiseworthy thoughts point to God. Dwell on these things. So we've got to guard our words carefully. And then secondly, under application, don't talk too much. I know that I am not the only one who is guilty of this, but if you're on that phone or if you continue to talk long enough, you're likely to say something that you should not have said. Proverbs 10, verse 19. It says, when there are many words, transgression, it's another word for sin, is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. So it's easy to let that juicy tidbit of information pour out of your mouth. A godly woman has self-restraint. She goes to the person. She does not talk about the person. How can a younger woman or anyone, for that matter, trust us or trust you if you are not wise with what you say. I know one Christian woman in another church that we were in a long time ago that was known as the gossip. And I knew who she was. I knew her name. We would speak to each other, hello, you know, on Sunday morning. But some people would say her first name and add the gossip like it was her name. And I'm like... I think they're overreacting. Well, one day my phone rang and it was this lady. And um, she had never called me before, ever. And so I just, you know, was chit chatting with her. And she said, The reason I called, I understand you're counseling so and so. It was some other lady. She said, I just called to find out what her problem is. And I'm like, 
do you really think I'm going to tell you? And she said, well, I thought I would try. And I said, don't you ever do that again. It's none of your business. So anyway, our daughter Anna is in our church, and she'll have counselees come up to her and start talking about their problems. Like she knows everything. She knows nothing. She doesn't even know who I'm counseling. And uh, they're shocked. Didn't your mother tell you? And she'll say, no, I don't even know who she's counseling or who she's talking to. Um, so anyway, but it's, I'm just so glad I didn't tell her anything. It's none of her business. Um, we have to be on guard for people like that. Some people will, and even if what they're hearing about somebody is not true, they don't know that, they'll pass it on. Um, and if you're not, if we're not careful, we will have let something slip out that we should not have said. So stand up to gossips and say something like, if we continue to talk about this or I continue to listen to you talk, we're likely to begin to gossip. So do talk, but don't talk too much. I had... Uh, we have had a lady in our church who was very, she was pretty, she was young, she was in a very bad marriage. And I knew that because I had counseled her. Well, one Sunday, she was sitting in between the two single young men that would always, you know, we always sit in the same seat, would sit uh, behind me. And they're laughing and talking, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. But I just thought, this is not good. These guys are grown men. They're single, and she is in a very unhappy marriage. Well, the, So I just let it go, and the next Sunday, the same thing happened. So I thought, I've got to go to her and express my concern. And... I thought, maybe I'll just go to the pastor and tell him. <laughs> but that's not what the Bible says. It says, go to the person. So I went to her privately, and I said, I'm very concerned about this because these guys are single, and you, you know, and your husband is not here. He's not a believer. You're on, in a difficult spot. She said, Martha, those are my nephews. I'm like, you can sit with your family any time that you want. So, but just imagine, I could have split the church over that and just made a big brouhaha about it. I, I was embarrassed. She thought it was funny. I didn't think it was funny, but I, was, I laughed. I was embarrassed. So, anyway, sometimes... People will come to you with their problems, with their issues, and you, you may need to hear just enough to be able to give them biblical guidance. And when, this, when that happens to me, I assume that they want to do what's right and honor God. But if they come, keep coming back and just saying, well, now he did this and now he did that and you need to know, but they didn't do biblically what they were supposed to do, I have to cut it off and say, and say, we can't keep talking about this. We're just gossiping now. And I believe you, what you're telling me, and I know, and it's hard, but you've got to do your part. So anyway, but don't let yourself be pulled into gossip. So, the third thing about the godly woman is she is not to be enslaved to much wine. And the Greek word is to be a slave. It comes from the Greek word doulos, to serve, to be in bondage. Matthew Henry said there was too much to be found among the Greeks at that time and place. 
um, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, in their commentary, they said this was a besetting sin of the Cretans. Cretans. And Clark said, habit is a species of slavery. Now, don't you know they were cute? Those older ladies sitting around gossiping and drinking and just getting drunk. And um, anyway, that <laughs> apparently Paul noticed it. So he included that in here. So under personal application, alcohol is not to be a problem in your life. It was a problem in my life for a long time. And I was, I was an alcoholic, and the Lord helped me to stop drinking before he saved me. But I just have so many regrets during that time of my life. And I did so many stupid, foolish things. Romans 6, verse 16 says, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? And then secondary applications, you can be enslaved to other things. Facebook, for instance, Twitter, TV, romance novels, Prescription drugs. Um, I had a lady that years ago that was in a Bible study, ladies' Bible study I was teaching. And um, I was in her home one day, and she had this romance novel sitting beside her on the table beside her sofa. And it was concerning to me. She was really struggling with her relationship with her husband. She wasn't happy with him. They would get in these big fights. That It was a mess. And um, she said, she kept t asking me, it's so hard to be a Christian. Explain that to me. And I said, I can't because it was hard being an unbeliever. The way of the transgressor is hard. Being a Christian is my joy. And so, anyway, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 says, Paul wrote, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So, this... A lady that was in my class, I saw that book, and I said to her, oh, can I look at this? And she said, sure. So I opened it up, and I just flipped two seconds through, and I came on this steamy sex scene. And I said, this concerns me. Listen to this. And I read it to her, and she said, oh, that... I just kind of read over those parts. That's not why I read these books. I said, who are you kidding? That's the best part of the book. <laughs> so she just poo-pooed the whole thing. It's no big deal. I'm not enslaved to these kinds of books. No wonder she hated her husband because they... You can, even Christian romance novels, you read those and those men are just unbelievably handsome and wonderful and smart and rescue them and all of that. So about six months later, she called me up crying. She said, I am addicted to these romance novels. I can't even go to the grocery store without buying another one. Will you help me? And I, I'm so, I was so glad that I said something that day. And then number three under application, drunkenness is a very serious sin, but by God's grace, you can repent. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. These verses, the first time I read them, I was just like, oh, wow, this is wonderful. It says, um, 
Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexual, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is writing to believers in Corinth who had been involved in all of these kinds of sins. And then he says to these Christians, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, meaning made holy, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So it's serious enough sin to send you to hell, but there's nothing that God can't forgive and change your heart. And then number four, instead of pursuing wine or food, use that energy to think about God, about God's goodness, his mercy. What does he want you to do during the time that, that you have to glorify him? Ask yourself, for Jesus' sake, what do I want to do with this block of time? The answer is usually obvious, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all for the glory of God. And another thing that the godly older women are to be doing, and by the way, I've had a lot of women say, I'm young, I can't disciple anybody else, or you hear pastors say there's somebody younger than you, um, but there's two things here. There's the gift of teaching and the gift of exhorting or discipling. doesn't matter how old you are. And then there's the older women. This thing in Titus 2 is the old women. I'm sorry. <laughs> but... If you're young, that doesn't mean you can't teach women. It, means, it doesn't mean you can't disciple women and help them and learn and counsel them, for that matter. Teaching what is good. Good, the Greek word is meaning commendable, excellent, honorable, right. Matthew Henry said, by example and her good life, Doctrinal instruction at home and in a private way. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. And this is in the context of the church. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. That's how come I'm not up here preaching on Sunday morning. That's how come I, I, the ACBC group, the biblical counseling group, I just, it says for women only. Now, the elders here have said if it's a medical issue, like I'm going to be speaking, Lord willing, on medications, psychotropic medications this fall, that the men can come because I'm not exegeting scripture. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. I got a text yesterday from a pastor that knows me and said, I just want you to know that, and he named the person that I know very well, her daughter has been ordained as a pastor. And I'm like, I put, I responded back and said, Mercy Percy, she knows better than that. And I hope her mother knows better than that. But teaching what is good. Matthew Henry says, by, the, by her example and her good life, instructing women at home and in a private way. 
we need to really study sound doctrine. Doctrine is just what the Bible teaches about a particular subject. And um, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. So, ladies, don't just know the passages on women, wives, and mothers, but know about the character of God. Know about the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of sin, how a Christian is to put off anger and instead be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving each other, how to put off fear and put on love in its place. Know in detail how to pursue love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Every time you're patient with somebody or you speak in a kind tone of voice or say a kind word, you are showing love. Love isn't rude. Love is not selfish. Love doesn't seek its own way. A lot of times, my counselees, I will have them memorize 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. If that's the second greatest commandment of all commandments, we should be really good at it and learn to think in those terms. We've got to study the Bible Use it rightly in context if you're really going to teach what is good. There is no substitute for knowing sound doctrine. You want to live out that doctrine in your life and model before others being a godly woman. Showing respect for the governing authorities, sometimes that's harder than other, at other times, it's very hard right now in this atmosphere, I think, to be uh, respectful. First Peter 2, verse 17, it says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, and then... Be respectful to the pastors in this church. Our pastor, write, every other week, he writes an article for the Noonan paper. And did y'all read the article he wrote this past week? It was so good about music. Because everybody gets, I get my wrinkles up about, I have strong opinions <laughs> about the music. Probably you do too, and what you prefer. But I thought, he did an exceptional job. First Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13. It says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Model showing respect for your husband. If you're married, Ephesians 5.33, let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. And then have this attitude of being for your husband, not against him. And have a love for God and his word and his people. So... If you're going to be teaching what is good, you need to know these principles and you need to know where they are so you can show them to somebody. Number three, you want to be humble. Admit when you're wrong. Even if, you, if somebody confronts you with something that you've done wrong and you don't understand what they're saying or you don't believe it, we always in our pride want to defend ourselves, ask them for an example. Can you show me an example of when I have done that? And don't overreact if people think you are less than perfect. Um, your family and your close friends already know you're not perfect. Matthew 5, verse 21 through 24. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, starting verse 23 and 24. 
Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread through all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So that was the Lord's ministry there. Um, when I was, oh wait, that's, I'm sorry, I was on the wrong chapter. Matthew 5, let's try this again. I'm thinking, that doesn't even make sense. All right, verse 23. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, there's an urgency here. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So if, if you know that somebody has something against you or they're upset with you, there's an urgency to go to them and say, I, d I don't know what I've done, but I think I may have offended you. Will you help me to understand this? And then number four, you want to use your spiritual gifts that God has given you. If it's teaching, then teach. If exhorting, then exhort. They are for the building up of the body of Christ. And do more, number five, than live a godly life. Talk about the Lord. Talk about the younger women uh, to him. When I was a kid, we had a club, <laughs> our neighborhood club, all these little girls, and we still have that club. Now, we're so old now, we don't get together very much, and one person at least in the club has died. But um, I... We, one time we were all meeting, and I had become a Christian, so I was just talking about it, and I was so excited. And one of the girls that lived on the other end of my street, she said, well, I'm a Christian too, but I just let my life be my example. Well, let your life be your example, but talk about the Lord, and don't just let that be your example. Talk to the younger women about him. And then point number E, it says encouraging the younger women. So we're to be reverent in our behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. And then number five, encouraging the younger women. Sophronizo is the Greek word. It means to recall one to his senses or to admonish. Admonish is a strong word. It means to warn, to, ex to exhort, to spur on. And it comes from the Greek word sophron, sophronizo, meaning of sound mind, prudent or wise, self-control, and sensible. So under application... We all need to learn how to give loving, biblical reproofs. A reproof is when you tell somebody what they're doing wrong. We're to do it gently. Galatians 6, 1 says, Looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. And then give them hope and tell them how to correct it. Be wise when you're working with a new Christian. You don't have to jump on top of them verbally with every little thing they do. They don't know any better. Just bring them along slowly. Make sure you have all the facts. And one of the things that you want to teach the other women how to do is how to receive reproof. It is not the end of the world when somebody thinks that they're less than perfect. And God gives grace to the who? Humble, but he resists the proud. And you want to, I, when I'm counseling, 
I like to keep in mind the biblical pattern in 2 Timothy 3, uh, teaching, reproving, be clear, give examples, correcting, explain, the Bible explains what we're doing wrong, but then it explains how to do it right. And then it says in training in righteousness. You've got to do it over and over and over again until you get it right. Now, a lot of people are afraid to confront somebody with something because what if she gets mad at me? Or they'll say, it won't do any good. He'll never change or she'll never change. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've ever heard that. We don't know that. We don't know what God is going to do with that information that you give somebody. Um, you can easily think love is patient. I can show love to her by being patient. But I can also show love. Love rejoices in the truth. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness by speaking the truth in love. Be very gentle in your tone of voice. Be very kind. Be very straightforward. So whether we're young, whether we're old, married or single, we are to help each other become as much like the Lord Jesus Christ as possible. And if you are indirect in your reproof and just vague and fuzzy, they're just, they're not going to know what you're talking about. People will change in clear, objective ways. God can use that. But if you're fuzzy and vague, they're just still not going to know what you're talking about. Um, you give them hope. Tell them there's nothing that has happened that God cannot forgive you for and others should not forgive you for. Won't you think about what I've said and pray and ask God to make it clear to you? And then you want with the other women to give appropriate praise and encouragement. Sometimes I'll say to the younger women, I'm glad that you put the Lord first. Or it's an encouragement to me to see what God is doing in your heart or your life. Or if they're going through a difficult time, I know this is hard, and every day that you endure, you're showing love to God because 1 Corinthians 13 says love endures all things. Or just simply, you did a good job. Thank you. So there are times that it, it takes time and God's supernatural grace to mature us into Christ-likeness. And it's not going to be a 100% process in this lifetime. But we should be maturing. We should be godly women that other women can come and, pr and pr believe them that they will keep their secrets now, some secrets we, we can't keep. If somebody says, I'm going to commit suicide, that's not a secret that I'm going to keep. But most um, things you can keep. But go to the scriptures and show them, step one, step two, step three, whatever, this is how the Lord wants you to respond so we looked at uh, the godly woman being reverent in her behavior, not a malicious gossip, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, encouraging the younger women. That is what we all should as aspire to become by God's grace. So let's pray. Our high king of heaven, we do humbly bow before you. It just is amazing how practical your word is and how precious it is that you have written the scriptures and given us insight into how you think and how we can glorify you the most. 
And I pray that all the women hearing this, that they will search out the truth of your word and prepare themselves to come along beside the other women and give them godly counsel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to A Minute with MacArthur. Friends! Oh, it's so good to see you! This class is all about how to read the Bible. This book is an incredible book. It was written by God and it will change your life. Well, welcome, ladies. It is a sweet joy to be back with you at the third annual Open Hearts Conference. I know that I say that every year, and it is a true blessing to be a part of it. I hear from so many of you during the years, and uh, I am excited to see what the Lord is doing in and through your life and through this conference, and it really is a joy for me to be a part of it. Well, when Brooke had first told me the theme for this conference and that it was gonna be spiritual sisterhood, I I immediately knew that I wanted to teach on the topic of love. Firstly, because this text has had such a huge impact on my own life in difficult times and circumstances in my Christian life and in body life and as I navigate ministry. And secondly, because I'm repeatedly receiving messages from you 
because you have had um, a difficult time in these last two years. And I'm having conversations with people both online and offline that these last two years of COVID have left many of your relationships broken and severed, and you're having difficulty moving forward. And I thought I would take this topic to try to address it, because I know that there are so many that have been left shattered in the wake of this pandemic in the last two years, and there have been offenses and wounds and hurts, and in some cases, outright cruelty towards us. And so we must seek to biblically handle these situations if we want to grow with one another in love. And I'm truly convinced that if we work to nail these two aspects of love, the patience and kindness of love, that every aspect of love will start to fall into place. And so we will start to see healing and reconciliation take place. And this will really be laying the foundation for some of you may not have had a difficult two years with your church. Maybe you're like Grace Life, and uh, we have had a wonderful time in these last two years growing together. And so you're going to need this passage for just body life or whatever you're facing in your life and whatever difficulty you're going to face. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to start in verse 1, but we're going to focus in on verse 4 and just actually two words from verse 4. But before we read the text, let me pray for you. Father, I'm so thankful for your word and that it ministers to our heart. And I pray for all of the women who are listening to this session and the entire conference, that they would learn from you, that your spirit would work mightily, that you would put the glory of Christ on display so that you receive that glory. I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see the wondrous, uh, marvelous words that you have written for us to live by and to glorify your son. And so I just pray that you will help me, that your spirit would lead me and guide me as I speak, and that you would give me clarity of mind so that um, you bless the women who are hearing your word. And we pray it all for the glory of Christ. Amen. All right, so if you'll look at 1 Corinthians 13, I'm just going to jump back to verse 1, and it says, If I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, and it does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails." This is such a beautiful and familiar passage for us. We tend to hear it a lot at weddings. I know at one point, actually, I do have it written on one of my walls. (laughs) Every morning in the bathroom, I can see it written on my wall. This is something that, a passage that we love and is very familiar to us. And this is a passage that actually tells us what love is. So often we're so confused about what love actually is. It seems abstract or we have trouble defining it. Here is the passage that tells us exactly what love is. And this is an agape love. So this is a love that God has. This love comes from God. He is the source and substance of this love. Not only does God act in a loving way, he is love. It is his very nature and essence. It is his being. This is the intra-Trinitarian, say that fast five times. (laughs) This intra-Trinitarian love existed before the world began. And we see that in John 17, 26. And it says, I have made your name known to them and I will make it known to them so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. And so this passage really just nails for us what love is. If somebody ever tells you that you're being unloving or you need to grow in love, tell them, where have I acted unkindly? Where have I been impatient? Where have I not um, bared or believed or hoped all things? So you can define what love is in your life with this passage. To summarize what agape love is, John MacArthur writes, quote, agape portrays unselfishness, self-giving, willful devotion, concern for others' welfare, unquote. 
It is a sacrificial love that lays aside self for the good and benefit of others, even if they hate us. And it's a love that moves us to action. It isn't something that we just feel and then there's no action attached to that. This love is love in action. And really, it's the kind of love that the Lord has for us. And we see that in John 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved the world, he so agaped the world that he was moved to action. And what did he do? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. This love is an action love, and we see that most clearly in God's love towards us. But Corinth was really struggling with this love and loving one another in their body life. She was a self-seeking, self-centered, self-promoting, self-righteous, all of the self words you could use that was characteristic of her. And they were lacking in the basic tenets of love towards one another. And Paul really needed to address this. We see that Corinth is much like the professing church today. And I think we can learn a lot um, from Corinth's heart. And if you want a deeper study into 1 Corinthians, uh, James has actually uh, exposited this entire book. So if you wanna go back and listen to it, it's a fantastic book to go through and just learn from what was happening in Corinth to strengthen your own love and walk with Christ. But again, we can learn from Corinth just really quickly some of the stuff that was going on and how often we lack in these ways when it comes to love. They were eloquent and winsome in their speech, but because they weren't about the truth, they merely sounded like clanging gongs. There was quarrels among them. They were showing a lack of patience towards one another. There was self-promotion and they would align themselves with different teachers. I'm of a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. And so they would do that for their own perceived benefit, their own perceived prominence. They weren't aligning themselves with those men because they were men that they wanted to follow as they followed Christ. They perceived that there was going to be some benefit towards themselves. And so they aligned themselves with those teachers. It was totally selfish. They were puffed up with knowledge, but they had no love. And they were starting to disdain the apostles' teaching. And they were even slandering the apostle Paul so much that in the second letter of um, Second Corinthians, the second letter that he sends them, um, he has to defend his apostleship. He's pushed to do that. He does not want to do it. Schisms and factions were infiltrating the body as they aligned themselves with different teachers that was creating just a pridefulness in them. And there was schisms, there was quarrels among them. Why is there quarrels among you? There's pridefulness in your heart. And so we know that pride is the antithesis of love. They were tolerating gross immorality amongst themselves. Somebody had their, their father's wife. That is devastating. They were joining themselves to prostitutes. They were being judgmental and unkind and boastful in their life. And they were taking each other to court, showing that they were easily provoked by one another. They were crushing the weaker brothers and trying to use religious liberty in a way that religious liberty is not to be used. Religious liberty is for the benefit of others to serve them faithfully. It is not so that you can go and engage in sin and crush the people around you. They were eating in temples, at that they were dining with demons in temples. Um, the biblical roles for manhood and womanhood were being skewed. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were only thinking of their own lust and desire. They were fighting for prominence with the showier gifts. So we know that Corinth had the gifts. They weren't void of these apostolic gifts. Uh, they were there, but they were doing them for their own prominence and their own desires. Some were saying there was no resurrection. That's awful. There was chaos and disorder in using their spiritual gifts. So people were coming in and seeing this chaos and disorder and they were going, you're all crazy. <laughs> and so they weren't doing it because they wanted to outdo one another in love and honor. They were doing it for their own honor. And all of this because they lacked love. Now this list can sound pretty discouraging, can't it? You look at Corinth and you're like, were you even saved? And you look at the professing church today and you think, are you even saved? But... Paul actually talks about them in chapter one, verse two, when he says that they have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. They've been set apart, saints by calling. And so he doesn't question their salvation, although some of them really needed to examine their heart to see if they were in the faith. He does indict them for being spiritually immature. He desired to give them meat to eat, but they were unable to do that because they were still drinking milk. They were fleshly and lacking in the basic tenets of love. 
They believe the church was there to promote their own welfare. And I bet if we pulled back the curtain on a lot of the dysfunction in relationships that have happened over the last two years, we would see the same self-promotion and self-preservation and just self in every expression in these relationships. And so we need to look at Paul and how he sought to address them and their lack of love because he loved them. He wanted them to grow in Christ likeness. He didn't want them to stay there. And so that's the same thing that we need to listen to him today, that we can't stay in that place of broken relationships and a lack of love. We need to move forward. And if 2 Timothy 3 is true, and it is true that in last days, in the last days, difficult times will come and men will fill the church and they will be lovers of themselves, then we're gonna need to be patient and kind in our love so that we can be used by God to bring others back to the truth. But also we need this passage so that we're on guard for our own hearts so that we do not fall into loveless service to one another and or lovelessness towards Christ. We don't wanna lose our first love. We have to learn the more excellent way. It just doesn't come naturally to us. But without a burning love and passion for Christ in his bride, Paul tells us that we're nothing. It's meaningless. All of it is meaningless. So when we look at this chapter and all of the tenets of love, it is so beautiful. Don't you wanna grow in this love? I know that I do. And I know that I have so far to go, but God is so gracious to us. So how do we do that? Well, we start with the two building blocks that are the foundation of love, patience and kindness. And those are going to be our two points. My husband likes to say that if you get these two aspects of love down, every other facet of love falls into place. And that's so true because if you are patient, you are not going to keep a record of wrongs. If you are um, kind, you're gonna be bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things. If you're patient, you're not gonna keep a record of wrong. And so these two aspects really are the pillar and the foundation of love. And if we get these two nailed, or we continue to grow in it because we never nail anything, uh, we will start to see our lives transform for the glory of God. So let's look at our first point. Number one, in verse four there, we're not gonna get very far. <laughs> the patience of love. Love is patient. This word here means long suffering. One lexicon de definition puts it this way. Patience is to bear up under provocation without complaint. This is a love that does not reach its limit. This is a love that does not ask, how long do I have to take this? How long do I have to bear this? Because patience endures all things and knows that God is in sovereign control of the difficulties that we have in our life. And he's not gonna lift those difficult situations or people or unloving people in your life a moment too soon or a moment too late. He will lift them when he has accomplished everything he needs to accomplish in you so that you are more like his son. And we have to remember here that this patience um, is not circumstantial patience, although it can be applied to circumstantial patience. This is about relational patience, love towards the body. Paul is addressing body life. That's why he's putting it right in the middle of the spiritual gifts. He has his discourse between chapters 12 and chapters 14, and smack dab in the middle of that is his discourse on love. He wants them to serve each other and love one another, especially using their spiritual gifts. Listen to Matthew Henry's commentary on this. So patience, it can endure evil, injury, and provocation without being filled with resentment, indignation, or revenge. It makes the mind firm, gives it power over the angry passions, and furnishes it with persevering patience. It shall rather wait and wish for the reformation of a brother than fly out in resentment of his conduct. I will put up with many slights and neglects from the person it loves and wait long to see the kindly effects of such patience on him." Isn't that so different from the entitlement that we see today? That we're not willing to bear with people because we're more concerned about the comfort that they're taking from us and our state rather than us caring about the person who's sinning against us, whose sin is not first and foremost against us, it's first and foremost about against the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that from Psalm uh, 51, against you and you alone have I sinned. And so patience says, you care more about the person sinning against you and their state before the Lord. And so you're willing to tarry with them. This is the kind of patience that does not seek revenge or retaliation, even when it's in our power to do so. It bears up under provocations and injuries with meekness and gentleness, 
and quietness of spirit. We love those words, don't we? But they're a little bit hard to live. Let me just define them for you because I think sometimes when we think about uh, quietness and meekness, we have a wrong view of what those are. But meekness is strength under control. It is a characteristic of our Lord. It is also a fruit of the spirit. It's translated gentle in some translations. And a meek woman doesn't lash out with her words. She doesn't lash out on social media and she doesn't lash out in her thoughts. She seeks to act and not act. She seeks to act and not react (laughs) to the provocations that she bears under. And she will only defend herself when the truth or the other person's well-being is at stake. She has complete control over her spirit in the power of the spirit because she's living according to the word. And quietness is an immovable spirit. She isn't bothered by injuries, gossip, slander, reproach, social media attacks, being wrongfully accused, lied to, lied against. Um, She isn't bothered when others don't listen to her and her wisdom, when she's overlooked and nobody thanks her or honors her for her service in the body. She is serving her king and her king alone. She has peace in her heart despite the circumstances because she knows her God and her heart is truly fixed upon him alone and his goodness to her, even amongst trying times and unloving people and difficult people, because unloving people tend to be the most difficult people. And she's a woman, even when dealing with enemies in the church, is doing it with the heart of the apostle Paul as he addressed Timothy in 2 Timothy in chapter two, verses 24 through 26, which says, the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient, when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant to them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Doesn't that sound like how the Lord has treated you? Hasn't he been so patient with you as you have wronged him and sinned against him time and time again that his fuse has never gone out? He has always been long suffering towards you. And he has it within his power to judge you. Listen to these verses that tell us how patient the Lord is in his love towards his people. Exodus 34, six says, then the Lord passed by in front of him, Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And then Nehemiah 9, 17 says, they refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds, which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you do not forsake them. And then Joel 2, 13, now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and that's his hesed love, that's his, his covenant love towards Israel, and relenting of evil. God would rather relent of judgment than judge people. He is so gracious, and as you look at his graciousness towards the nation of Israel, they are a nation that sinned against him and sinned against him over and over and over there, the picture of spiritual harlotry in the Bible. And yet God is not done with that nation. He is still patiently tarrying with them. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in, all of Israel will be saved. Isn't that patience of the Lord just incredible? How often do you think about the patience of the Lord and his slowness to anger towards you? Do you know what that also means? It means that you never have to fail to approach the throne of God for fear of exhausting his patience towards your sin and your besetting weaknesses. We can come boldly and confidently before his throne to receive grace and mercy and find grace in the time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. You never have to keep from coming to the Lord. His anger is not running out towards his people. And he is so patient. And because it is within his power to judge us and he put that judgment upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he also calls us to be patient with others. We are his representatives. We're here to show to those who cause us injury or harm us 
that we have been shown the very patience of God that we are showing to them. He has handed us his patience in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to treat others that way. For us to treat others with contempt when he has shown us such abundant kindness and patience is a great sin against the Lord. And I think we all know the parable of Matthew 18. This is in regards to forgiveness, but uh, where the slave owner has a slave and he has this incalculable debt that he has to pay and he can't pay it. And so he begs the slave owner to release him and the, and the slave owner finds compassion and says that he's gonna release him. And then he goes and finds another slave who, who owes him a very small debt and he beats him and he puts him in prison. And then the other slave owner finds out about it and calls him a wicked slave and that he will turn him away. That's, that, that's very illustrative language for us to trifle with the kind of love. Now, again, that, that is in regards to forgiveness, but the principle still stands. That was something that the Lord has been so gracious to show us, and we turn, and we don't give that same love to other people is a great sin against the Lord. And so if you are doing that, he is so gracious to forgive when you have sinned against him in that way and seek to love other people. And scripture is clear that we are to show others the same love that we have been shown. Paul implores us in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which with you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. And in Colossians 3, 12, he tells us to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. And in another verse in Ephesians, he says, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. But being long-suffering isn't an easy task, is it? It's coming at us a lot. And it's hard work to put off the flesh. We don't naturally respond with this great patience and love and compassion and um, being tolerant. This is a work that we have to do. And it's a work that only the spirit can do in our hearts. But I think so many times we struggle is because number one, I think we really truly believe that we don't deserve to be mistreated by anybody. And so as long as you have that in your heart, you would never say that. You would never say that out loud. But your actions show that you do actually believe that. And, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> that when, when something comes up against me, I, why are you treating me this way? How dare you? Um, and so we have to be really careful with that. We need to know that the only way that we are going to grow in the practice of being long-suffering and slow to anger and patience is when difficult people come into our life. They're there to shave off the rough edges of your life. And so it's that iron sharpening iron. And so if you don't have those difficult people in your life, how are you ever going to know where you're at in regards to love? And so we need to know that those people are there because we need to grow in Christ likeness. And again, the Lord is not gonna bring anything into your life that you do not need, nothing. Everything that is brought into your life is first kissed by the hand of God and he is abundantly good in every situation that he will turn it for your good and his glory. And that's Romans 8, 28. So if he's not lifting or taking out those difficult people from your life, it's because he has something to teach you, to teach you about your own heart and to teach you about him. And two, I think we're really fixated on immediate justice in our day. That's a really big thing, justice. Any little offense needs to immediately be given the verdict of guilty. But sometimes the Lord doesn't do that, does he? And so we have to bear up under what he's brought into our life. We can pray and ask the Lord to remove it for us, but if he does not, then we have to bear up under that. And, and this verse in Romans 12 is so helpful. In verse 19, it says, "'Never take your own revenge, beloved.'" but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a high standard, isn't it? Especially in our entitled culture where we just wanna be like, you're offending me, close the door, I'm done with you. I don't have to talk to you, I don't have to deal with you. In the church, you do have to deal with people. You can't just merely tolerate people, you actually have to love them. So my friend, if that is happening to you and your situation is not coming away from you, he will vindicate you. And he will vindicate you because he's vindicating the truth. And so if you are unjustly being treated, he will vindicate you. And lastly, the provocation might be years upon years. And it's hard, but you have to take heart. 
The grace of God will not call you to bear up under something year after year that he will not give you the power and grace to walk through and his spirit is there with you as you depend upon him for his power in your weakness. And we know that from 2 Corinthians 12 where um, Paul asks for that thorn in the flesh to be removed and the Lord says, no. He pleads with him three times and he says, no, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Listen to what Spurgeon has to say about this. This is perhaps, quote, This is perhaps the hardest work of all, for many people can be affectionate and patient for a time, but the task is to hold on year after year in reference to our fellow Christians. Love holds out under all rebuffs. We endure not some things, but all things for the sake of Christ. That's why you're bearing up under it. That's why you have difficult people in your life. And you don't know what the Lord is doing in the heart of those people who are being offensive and hurtful towards you, what God is doing in them and how he might use you to bring them to repentance. And so we need to consider not only what the Lord is doing in our own heart, but in the hearts of those who are offending us. But it is hard and it's okay that it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. But when we lean upon the Lord, we know that we are doing all things for Christ's sake, his glory. He's asking us to do this. Does this kind of patience categorize your life? Are you patient under injuries or are you quick to anger and to lash out? Moms, I think we have a lot of um, times where we are impatient towards our children, especially littles, uh, where it's easy to lash out because that constant wear and tear on you is every day and moment by moment. But the Lord wants you to be patient under those injuries. Have you failed in your patience towards one another? Again, the Lord is so gracious and kind. Confess your sin to him. Does your love suffer long or do you have a time limit on your love? Is there a timeline? You can offend me this much, but then I'm done. The Lord would never do that to you. He would never put a time limit or a limit on his love towards you. Are you quick to anger when somebody repeatedly sins against you or do you show them the same kind of love that God in Christ has shown you? Do you often focus on the patience that God has towards you on a daily basis? This is a work we need to do. We constantly need to remember the patience that has been handed to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are the people in your life that are hard to deal with? Make a list of evidences of God's grace in their life, especially if they're in the church. Because if they're in the church, you gotta remember, these are people you are joined to in Christ. You will stand before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, holding their hands, worshiping the king. And so there is evidence of the spirit in that person's life. Make a list of that and praise the Lord for them, especially if this is an offense that just cannot be um, fixed or rectified or a reconciliation or anything like that. Look for evidences of, of the grace of God in their life. And also remember, for every difficult person you have in your life, you're that difficult person for somebody and you don't even know it. I'm just that prideful, I don't know it. (laughs) So that is just a very small treatise on the patience of love. But we don't wanna stop there. We don't wanna stop at just the um, bearing up under those provocations. He calls us to go the extra mile and to show kindness when bearing up under these provocations, which brings us to our second point in verse four, or our second word. Love is kind, and that's the kindness of love is our point. Love is so kind. And while patience is a passive verb, kindness is an action verb. With patience, it's bearing up under a thing being done to you, but with kindness, you are the one acting. You are the one moving forward. This is the aspect of love that acts kindly. It's it's a working love. Kindness is said to be love in working clothes. It's full of mercy and pity and compassion. And while you work for the good of another. I wanna quote Matthew Henry again because he's just so wonderful and why use my own words when his are so good. (laughs) He says this about kindness. It is benign, bountiful. It is courteous and obliging. The law of kindness is in her lips. Her heart is large and her hand is open. She is ready to show favors and to do good. She seeks to be useful and not only seizes on opportunities of doing good, searches for them. This is her general character. She is patient under injuries and apt and inclined to do all the good offices that are in her power. So not only is she just tolerating the people who are provoking her, she is actively looking for ways to serve them. 
What are active ways that you can serve people who are offending you? My husband's favorite definition of this word is the bestowal of undeserved benefits or the granting of unmerited favor. He likes to say the heaping of undeserved benefits. And so while you're being provoked and you're up under that provocation, you are working to heap undeserved benefits. That is the action of kindness. And this is all done without any expectation that this kindness is going to be returned. Isn't that so opposite of the self-seeking church in Corinth and of our day. We do things because we want to be praised, and we want to do things because we want to be noticed, but we can't. We have to do things not expecting anything in return because we're working for our king, and he will reward us for the difficulty that we face. And he is the model of kindness. It is out of God's goodness that he deals bountifully and kindly with his creatures, Louis Burkhoff says. Listen to these verses about how kind the Lord has been to you, even when you were his enemy. Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, do you see that? You see he has love and then it moves into action because he sends his son He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Wow, listen to all that kindness being heaped on you in this verse. You get his son, you see his kindness, his mercy. He's washed you. He's regenerated you. He's given you his Holy Spirit. He's poured out his riches through Jesus Christ abundantly upon you. He's justified you by his grace and you're heirs of Christ. If that is not abundant kindness, I don't know what is. And Ephesians 1, 3 says, um, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And he even takes care of all of our needs. Matthew 6 says that if you seek first his righteousness, Uh, and his kingdom, that all these things will be added unto you. He is so good and so caring and so kind, and he abundantly cares for his creatures. His creatures are made in his image, and he calls us to be patient with them as well, even the ungrateful and evil ones. We know that from Luke 6, 35, and it says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, but kindness." And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Think of that. Think of how kind the Lord was towards you, even as an unbeliever. His goodness towards you is that you get to see his creation. You have these eyeballs that can see in dimension, and you see beauty of all of the things that he has created. You have smell. You can smell beautiful things. And if anybody knows me, you know I love wax melts, and uh, I love the smell of them. They just make me so happy. <laughs> it's a grace of God. Uh, taste, all of the different flavors and, and all of the different food that we get to taste and touch. It is amazing the kindness and goodness that God has shown us just in common graces. Have you ever just looked at a flower and seeing the intricacies of how he has put together flowers and trees and animals and that you actually have eyes to see them. And it's not 4K. (laughs) It's better than that. Uh, But that you get to take part in that. That's his goodness and kindness towards unbelievers. He gets, you get to take part in marriage and relationships and delight and enjoyments. All of these things he's poured out on evil and ungrateful men. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, Aaron, do we just let people mistreat us? Do we just let them walk all over us and never say anything? No, that's not what I'm saying. Bearing up under provocation and heaping undeserved benefits does not mean that we exclude the other Christ-like virtues like correction, exhortation, discipline, and rebuke. These in and of themselves are evidences of God's love. Don't we love it when God corrects us? Maybe not in the moment, because it's not joyful, it's sorrowful, but to those who have been trained by his discipline, it, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. We are thankful when God brings those things into our life because we see where we've lacked love and where we can grow in that love. So we have to be willing to be vessels that demonstrate the fullness of God towards others, fullness of love of God towards others. 
in correcting them. And that's a really hard thing to do, but it's an act of love. And so, no, it doesn't mean that you just allow people to mistreat you and never say anything. Sometimes the most loving thing is to correct them and to say something. We cannot have truth without love, and you cannot have love without the truth. Love doesn't indulge the sinfulness of others, but it's the Lord's love towards us that exposes these things and brings the sinner to repentance, whether that's a right relationship with him through salvation or whether that's another believer that we're being used to bring them back into communion with him because that has been broken by sin. And so we do need to correct other people. Well, you might be thinking, Aaron, you just don't know how difficult the people are in my life and in my church. That's fair. I don't. But I do know how difficult you are have been towards Christ, because the Bible tells me how difficult people have been towards Christ. And I know that if you're listening to this today, and if you are in Christ and he has given you a new heart, he has shown you his supreme love. And I wanna show you this in 1 John 4, 9. So we're gonna quickly look at that. If you wanna just turn there, 1 John 4, 9. And I wanna quickly look at two aspects of God's supreme love, the incarnation, and the atonement. And friend, if you are not looking at this supreme love of God in specifically these two aspects towards you, you will endlessly struggle in your desire and your battle to love other people because you have to see so clearly what God in Christ has done for you. So 1 John 4, 9, is that what I said? (laughs) I hope that's what I said. It says this, by By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. So in this verse, we see the incarnation. In verse 10, it says he, God, sent his son. Here's his act of kindness towards people who are so undeserving. The perfect son of God left glory with the father to put on human flesh. He was born up under the law, under sinful parents, and was rejected by his very own brothers and everyone who came across him. He experienced all the limitations of humanity, yet he was still truly God. And so when when Jesus Christ leaves eternal glory with the Father and he puts on human flesh through the virgin birth and he, he is born a human, he never loses any of who he is as God. He does not lay aside his deity, that's heresy. His deity and his glory is veiled. It is still there. It's like the, the blazing sun is still blazing when a cloud passes in front of it, it's still there in all of its glory. You just can't see it. And so when God puts on human flesh, it doesn't take away anything of who he is as God, but he is truly human, true human. And so you have God and man coming together as the one person, Jesus Christ, and that's called the hypostatic union. And he did this for you while you were yet sinners. You were at war with him. You were hostile towards him. We like to think that we had some neutrality with God before we were saved, but you're not. You're born in sin. You're born at war with him. There is no neutrality of God. You were enemies of the cross. You were ungodly and unrighteous, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you were in the domain of Satan. But in his perfect kindness and patience, he shows us the condescension. And this wasn't a small step, ladies. This was not just a, oh, he just stepped out of heaven and he he put on human flesh. No, this was a massive condescension for the eternal, infinite God to put on human flesh of of his finite creatures was a massive condescension. And so in his perfect patience, he was shown or he shows us that he is the infinite putting on that which is finite. He is the omnipotent experiencing weakness of human frailty. He possesses all power, yet he experienced the weakness of human frailty. The omniscient having to grow in wisdom. Can you imagine that? The one who knows all things. You never teach God anything. He knows all things, yet in his humanity, he's growing in wisdom and stature. The immutable experiencing growth. God is unchanging. He does not change, but he's growing and experiencing growth as a human the immortal putting on mortality, the bread of life experiencing hunger. That is amazing. The living water crying out in thirst upon the cross. He went from sitting on a throne, the king of kings, 
to becoming a slave. He went from intimate communion with the Father to being rejected by the very people he came to save. He knew only perfect love from the Father, perfect union, perfect communion, but now he will know what it was like to be smitten and stricken and afflicted by the Father. My friend, when you struggle with your love, think about the incarnation and the condescension that Christ made to save you while you kept sinning against him. Our sin is not little, and I, and I think that's another area where we really struggle, is we actually believe that other people's sin against us is more great than the sin that we commit against the Lord. And, and this is a very provocative statement, but the most gruesome sin that could ever be committed against you is nothing in comparison to the seemingly small sin that you commit against God every day because he is thrice holy and he is infinite and he is eternal. And so if you have before you the sin that you are constantly committing against God, it will help you to love others, even in the most difficult situations. And so keep your eyes fixed on the incarnation when you're having difficulty because Christ did that for you. So not only was he willing to be beaten, rejected, taking on human flesh, scourged, his skin being ripped from his body. He was mocked. He was punched in the face. He was spat on. Think about that. The very saliva glands that he formed are spitting on him. The very hands that he formed in the womb of a mother is punching him. The very air he's allowing people to breathe, they are using to curse him and to make fun of him and ridicule him. It is really crazy. And he was marred beyond any man. But he did this all because God's great love for us. And he, because of that great love for us, he became the propitiation for our sins. God did not just send one of his sons. He gave his only son, his most precious son, his most costly son, his most valuable son, God of very God, to be the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of the world and who would appease and satisfy the just anger, not against everyone else's sin, your sin. And we have to keep that in our mind. Listen to what Terry Johnson has to say about this passage. How great is the love of God. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up, Romans 8, 32. The father did not limit or reduce the suffering afflicted upon his son for the sins of the world. He did not withhold one whit of the full toll of judgment. The strokes fell upon him in unrelieved intensity with all of the weight due the sins that he bore. That is amazing. He did not relent. He did not pour out a, a different level of wrath upon the son. He drank the full cup of the father's wrath. And he did that for you. Remember that when people sin against you, that his atonement has appeased the wrath of God. And because he's appeased the wrath of God on our behalf, our sin has been put on the shoulders of the son. We can love others with that same love. So remember the incarnation and the atonement. And remember that while you were weak, vile and enemies, hostile to the cross, hating God and in the dominion of Satan, he loved you so much that he sent the most costly gift he could send for the death that you deserve. How do you withhold love from others when you're looking at that? You can't because he has loved you so faithfully. Is this the kind of kindness that categorizes your life? Are you kind to others who are unkind to you? Are you heaping undeserved benefits on others through service, even when they've sinned against you? Or are you withholding it? Are you merely tolerating the people around you? Are you looking for opportunities to faithfully serve them? And think of all the ways that God has been kind to you in his goodness. Are you kind in your thoughts towards others? That's where the battle begins. That's where kindness begins, is in your thoughts. Are you kind in your words towards others, in private and in public? Are you willing to show the same kindness to others that God in Christ has shown you? And are you purposefully looking for those opportunities to show kindness, or are you, again, just tolerating others? What's the reason for that? Figure out what's happening in your heart. Is there bitterness? Are you afraid you're gonna get hurt again? And so you just need to figure out what's in your heart that's keeping you from fully serving those people in a way that would show Christ-likeness. And if you are here today, if you are 
listening to this online and you are not saved and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, God has been abundantly patient with you. And although he has been abundantly patient with you and has heaped undeserved benefits upon your life and his goodness, you do not wanna put this God to the test. You are breathing his air. Your heart is beating because he is allowing it. And you do not wanna have to reckon with God over the sin that you have committed against him. You can search your conscience right now and know that you have sinned against him for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I just laid out the gospel for you that the son left eternal glory with the father because of sinful man. And he was born under the law and he kept the law perfectly in thought, word and deed. And then he went to the cross and he was brutally beaten. He faced the fierce wrath of God for your sin, for the sin of all of those who would believe. And then when he finished, appeasing the wrath of God, he gave his spirit up and his body went into the grave. And three days later, he rose from the grave showing that his work satisfied the demands of the law, death. The father was pleased with him. That's why we have the resurrection. And because he is resurrected, all of those who believe in him will also be resurrected unto newness of life. You do not wanna be resurrected unto death because you do not wanna pay for your own sins. That's an eternity of judgment in hell. That is a very, very scary place to be. And so don't leave this conference without considering your soul before him. And so our prayer for you is that you would turn from your sin, that you would confess Jesus as Lord and you would put your faith and trust in him. All of the work is already accomplished. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that you are saved and he'll give you a new heart and he'll give you new affections, and you'll be able to live for him and start that process of fullness of joy that will carry on into all eternity, and you will be able to look at the beauty of the most loving God who has heaped nothing but undeserved benefits upon your life and the kind of patience that you can't even comprehend. You'll marvel at that for all of eternity, and you will not reach the bottom of that. I just love that thought. He's so vast. He's so infinite. You will never reach the bottom. Don't wait, reckon with the Lord today. That's what he's created humans for is to worship him. He wants to be worshiped. My friends, this is the patience and kindness of love. I wish I had more time because we are just scratching the surface on these, but I want you to just start that process now to study his patience and his kindness towards you for you to be ever looking at the incarnation and the atonement and meditating on his goodness. If you're struggling with loving people, get these two things in order and focus and meditate and praise and worship the Lord for his patience and kindness towards you. And I wanna leave you with John's words in 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Let's pray. Father, your love for us is something that we can't even grasp with our finite minds. You have been so kind to us and how your son has spoken this world into existence and you have shown us nothing but goodness and patience since the moment that we have been born. There are many of us whom you tarried, I know myself, 23 years you tarried. I have not tarried 23 years with difficult people, but you tarried with me. And if we just each think about how long you have been slow to anger towards us, even before salvation, that helps us to love other people. I just pray for all of these women that they would focus upon your love, the love that has been poured out through your son, Jesus Christ, that your spirit would cause just a great worship and adoration of your son and seeing all of the love that you have given us so that we are able to love others faithfully the way you have called us to love them so that we can be your representatives here on earth and that people will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Father, help us to start this process. If there is relationships that need to be mended, I pray that you would mend them, that the process of laying the foundation of patience and kindness, that reconciliation will start to take place and that all of the difficult people in our life would see nothing but the same love that you have shown us, Lord. And so I just pray that you will start that process, even if many of us looking at, especially the last two and a half years, maybe the wrongs have not been done to us. Maybe we have been the wrong doers. And so I just pray that we would confess our lack of love and that we would 
um, come before your throne and that we would be shown mercy and grace and you would cover that sin for us so that we can start the process of loving people faithfully. We pray all of this for the glory of Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. As wounds which bar the chosen ones Bring many sons to glory